wary when it comes to things, for example, such as uh, trying to identify or target uh, supposed high-risk youth, youth who are at high risk of suicide, of high risk of uh, extreme forms of violence, such as school shootings. Uh, and this is because of a phenomenon that in, uh, scientifically we refer to as base rate. A base rate just means how often something happens. And the less often something happens, the more difficult it is to predict. So, for example, if we're talking about suicide in the United States, we're talking about a phenomenon uh, that claims the lives of 0.0001% of uh, Americans each year. Hmm. So that is the base rate of suicide. So if you were to, you know, come into a clinic and say, you know, I'm going to judge this individual to be at, let's say, low, moderate, or high risk of suicide, this is an incredibly, incredibly difficult task. And unfortunately, when it comes to children, if we have a situation where we're placing children into intervention groups or giving them treatment that they might not necessarily need, oftentimes kids who are judged to be at high risk, they already feel like loners. They already feel stigmatized. And to put them into a a group where we're kind of singling them out again, this could actually have the exact opposite of the intended effect. We could be manufacturing more high-risk youth. I remember years ago it seemed that every child was was getting diagnosed with uh, ADHD and being prescribed Ritalin, for goodness sake. Yes, I mean, this, this is something where the, the phenomenon of overdiagnosis, some mm-hmm. people call it bad diagnosis. Um, is it a real thing? Well, certainly when we take a look at, uh, at diagnostic rates in juveniles, we do see that there's been certain... A kind of time-related trends in terms of uh, something like uh, childhood onset ADHD, childhood onset bipolar disorder, childhood onset psychosis, and schizophrenia. Uh, you know, we do see this, and there's you know experts on both sides of these debates. Those who say, "Listen, at the end of the day, this is a new phenomenon. It's uh, it's come about because of issues such as technological advancement, uh, making kids have shorter attention spans, having a harder time to." Uh, really be focused on the real world, Mm -hmm. quote-unquote. So, so, you know, people would make that argument as well, so detractors of the idea that there's uh, an overdiagnosis of these kinds of phenomena. But whether there is or not, it's really up to conjecture. Oh, well, when I was a kid, I, I, you know, I don't know what the big difference is, for goodness sakes. You know, like uh, nobody I knew was taking Ritalin. I don't... Uh, mind you, wait a minute, we we didn't have all these high-tech games. We went outside and we played. Uh, we went fishing and we actually communicated with our parents at something called breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, do you think that might have something to do with it? You know, I, I think it's possible. Uh, you know, it's less my scientific perspective, more my personal perspective. Yeah. Of, uh, the idea that when it comes to... Uh, to the implementation of so much technology. You know, it used to be, let's say, for example, I I got on a plane. I got on a plane uh, and I flew over, let's say, to Norway to be able to teach. It's an incredibly long flight. Mm -hmm. And the entire time you're going, what are you going to do? You're going to talk to the person next to you. You're going to read a book. You kind of zen out. You relax. Now, while I'm walking on the tarmac in the first place, I could be listening to my iPhone or my iPad I get on there, I can be playing, you know, my games, I can be, you know, doodling around with apps, I can log into the internet now. Some people are saying that now we're going to start passing laws so that, or passing regulations so that you can actually use your cell phones on flights. No matter where we go, we can't get away from this constant connectedness with everyone else in the world. And some of the research that we see coming out from uh, researchers uh, who are investigating things like social networks and mm-hmm. such I really do suggest that you know there are real, uh, you know, not just uh, psychological, but in some cases biological consequences of uh, of really this new kind of, of media that we have and all these new technological advances, which make our lives easier. But uh, you know, it's certainly not a, a silver bullet. Yeah, I'm just going to. I, I wonder what's going to happen to these 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 young people that are constantly on their iPhones or their iPads, their smartphones, when they come to the real world and they have to do something called communicating verbally with somebody else. 
sure. I think that when it comes to communication, it, it's definitely something obviously where, you know, I mean, it, it's such, such a critical skill, public mm-hmm. speaking, uh, interacting socially with others. Uh, this said, uh, taking a look at uh, different forms of communication, uh, really, I have just been absolutely amazed by the, the skill which uh, particularly adolescents who I've worked with just over the past several years, and even some of my interns at the Global Institute are, are just incredible in terms of how effective they are uh, at communication. But it, it's certainly not the communication that maybe we grew up with, Rob, in terms of, you know, just calling somebody up or writing a, a God forbid, yeah. a handwritten letter oh my goodness. Uh, to someone, you know, it's totally, totally different than what we experienced. But uh seems to be uh, something where, you know, this is the trajectory that things are going in, and uh, and so, you know, it's a lost art, maybe. You know, my, my, my children and my grandchildren call me old-fashioned because I say, don't text me, call me, not on the cell phone, on the house phone. You come into the house, <laughs> there's a little table beside our front door, that's where you leave your your cell phone. That's where you leave your iPad. If you come here, you come to see me, your grandmother, your aunts, your uncles, your family members. And you know what? If they don't like it, well, there's a front door and a back door, Ollie. <laughs> you know, I, I think that society, when it comes to all this new high tech, we're way too politically correct. You know, I, I'm sorry, you go to a restaurant, you see mom, dad, and little, little Dick and little Jane, they're there instead of talking, they're, they've got their little iPads going or their little cell phones. What's happening to society? And does this have anything to do with the increase in mental illness that we're seeing? Sure. I, I think that there's a, certainly a lot of conjecture on this. I'm, I'm always brought back to stories mm-hmm. that... Uh, my mother told me, uh, in terms of my, my mother uh, was a hippie, no question. She has a long hair, flower child. She's the most amazing woman. Uh, my know. kind lady. And Oh, she's incredible, incredible, Rob. One of these people, I uh, can only hope I could be half the person that she is. And uh, But my mother would tell me loads of stories, of course, about how, you know, at the end of the day, you know, uh, she would get into, you know, all kinds of trouble when it came to, oh, the, you know, the hair is too long and, Society is crumbling, and this notion of you know everyone loving each other, and you know God forbid something like you know interracial marriage. Oh my goodness, you know every everything is going to collapse yeah. in society. Uh, you know there was a, a great political cartoon that I enjoyed very much, um, which was basically uh, this uh, elderly woman sitting in a chair making uh, a racially uh, what we would now consider a racially insensitive comment and. Uh, their child was a hippie, and I looked at them and said, oh, my gosh, you know, you're so old-fashioned, I can't believe it. And then there was another one of kind of <laughs> present day of, you know, another person who was elderly sitting down making a homophobic comment. Yeah. And their child said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. How could you say something like this? You know, it's one of these things where all of us, regardless of our generation, you know, we have our zeitgeist uh, that we're following. And, and I am sure that uh, for my kids, like and kids that I don't know what they're going to be into, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to hate it. But I don't know what it is yet. But all the something's going to be there. But all the information that that we're that we're inundating with ours ourselves with, whether it's on the radio, the television, the iPhone, whatever, that can't be good for us. Are we programmed to process all this information that we're being bombarded with, Doctor? Sure. I think the human brain is, is just an absolutely incredible thing. Uh, it's certainly the case where we're capable of processing a, a tremendous amount of information, but mm-hmm. one thing that's kind of a lost start is really focusing on a single task. We typically these days, because there's always so much to do and juggle, we really you know, have come to embrace this idea of multitasking. However, we know from the scientific literature that multitasking may actually result in a greater fatigue, and at the end of the day, doing multiple things more poorly than doing one thing well. Uh, so that said, of course, certain resources that are now available, something as simple as Google. There was a cart- another cartoon that I saw that I loved, was these two little animals sitting down on a, uh, on a sofa, and the name of the cartoon was uh, The World Before Google. 
And one of them just said, hey, I have a question I don't know the answer to. And the other one just said, oh, well, that's too bad. (laughs) (laughs) And and this was the issue is these days, you know, it's it's incredible on on the device that I'm, I'm calling you right now, Rob, the idea that, you know, after our pleasant conversation is done, I can hit end and then literally search for any piece of information in the world on the same device. It's just incredible. So so what you're saying is I, I'm easy to forget. That's it. I'm off the phone. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> These things, well, well, I, I need Somebody get me a Come drink. On, I mean, get me some value. So many hours of the day. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so... How do we? Where do we go from here, Doctor, when it comes to mental illness? Where do we go from here to helping people who are depressed? And how can we help them? Sure. Sure. I think that w- one thing is really a, it's a fundamental, this is the, the fundamental paradigm shift, as it were. The fundamental shift in thinking is shifting thinking about mental illness as a character flaw or something that, you know, this only happens to a select group of people where there's something inherently wrong with them, where we want to kind of keep our hands off, that's Mm -hmm. them, and this is us, versus uh, really humanizing these these issues and saying at the end of the day, absolutely, these are people who have, they have medical issues, uh, just like someone with, let's say, cancer, just like someone with cardiac problems, and we just need to make sure that they get the care they need to be able to live as fulfilling lives as the rest of us can only hope to live ourselves. I think that that's really step one and possibly the most important one. How about the, the, the support and the funding from the government? Does that have to be increased substantially? I, I, in my opinion, yes. Uh, this is definitely something where you know, we've had here in the United States uh, a real problem mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, obtaining uh, enough funding for the behavioral sciences to be able to do the kind of public health research uh, to be able to support initiatives to provide greater access um, to the to mentally uh, ill populations. And the funny thing is that there's certain interventions that have been found, that they're very simple, have been found to be very effective. To give you an example, uh, and when I say this, a lot of people have a very strong reaction, is to pay people to take their medication. Now, when I say this, people say, oh, my goodness, you've got to be joking me. If you release someone from hospital, mm-hmm. you pay them $5 to take their medication. They come back to the hospital just to take the meds. Yeah. Why in the world should I pay someone $5 to be able to do this? But at the end of the day, not only the adherence to the medication, but the tremendous cost savings of not having these individuals subsequently involved either in the revolving door of the mental health system in terms of hospitalization Mm -hmm. or in that tragic revolving door of the criminal justice system, we end up saving a tremendous amount of taxpayer dollars by simply spending relatively little up front for these kinds of initiatives. Stand by, doctor. Stand by, sir. We've got to take our final break here. Dr. J.P. Singh is our guest. G-I-F-R-I-N-C dot com is the website. We'll be back on the other side as we wrap up this hour in the Act Zone. Don't go away. With each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go-bag. Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com, and author-signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. 
That's www.wentechfails.com and www.matstein.com. 